now as you understood now the delta that u is a state function right we discuss that u is a state function and we tell that delta u that is a change in internal energy depends only on the final and initial states that is uf minus uy now i can think of an infinitesimal change right an infinitesimal change in the internal energy or we can call it like a differential change in internal energy which is denoted by du now if du is a du is a differential change then if i tell if i integrate du so the total differential and if i integrate du from states ui to uf basically the integration will basically give me uf minus right now this du is called a total differential or an exact This is a very important so the state function property is very important for dynamics because it gives you so since u is a state function you can write it as a total differential or an exact differential and these exact differential properties exploited at various times and used at various times and this becomes very very important in dynamics right so it becomes very important to understand um, or it, it is it's a very useful tool which if you have a state function you can express express it as a total differential and you can using this total differential or exact differential properties you can derive many useful relations that you will uh, see later right so another thing that i wanted to tell you that you have to be very careful in thermodynamics about units right for example in general we will use throughout this course si units so si units are like Joule, say for example, internal energy. Uh, the SI unit of internal energy is joule, and joule, as you know, one joule is basically equal to one newton meter, right? Joule is the unit of energy. Joule is the unit of work. Work is like force times displacement, and force as a unit of newton. And uh, you have like uh, and uh, for length, uh, for distance, uh, the unit is meter. So one newton meter is one joule, and one newton is nothing but one kg. Uh, meter square per second square, right? Because it comes from uh, Newton's law, force equal to mass into acceleration, right? And then heat and work, right, have the same unit as energy, has the same unit as energy. And uh, what is the unit? Joule, right? So heat, uh, the unit of heat is joule. We will take the unit of work as joule. So basically, all of these units we have to be very consistent, and we are using SI units. But many a times in problems, sometimes uh, people use uh, uh, this uh, British units, and sometimes they use this uh, CGS units, so-called CGS units. For example, calorie is still a very popular unit for heat input, right? And one calorie is defined as the heat input to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius, right? So it's one calorie is the heat input to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And one calorie is nothing but 4.184 joules, right? It's an exact conversion. You can think how is it derived. You you think about it a little bit. That it's one gram of water, one degree Celsius. You want to raise it by one degree Celsius, and you get uh, and what what you define is one calorie. And you will see later why this is an exact conversion, or you can yourself also work it out. Now, electron volt. is another very popular unit uh, of energy and electron volt is basically when you express it some we we generally express energy per kg or energy per mole but if we want to express energy per atom then electron volt is the unit of choice and electron volt is the kinetic energy acquired when electron that is accelerated from rest to a potential difference of 1 volt as you can see one electron volt is basically energy per atom so to see one electron volt and what is the relation between electron volt and joule you can definitely you can understand 
that there is somewhere Avogadro number coming in because one electron volt equals to 0.16 and then we want to say 10 joules, right? So it is the energy acquired or kinetic energy acquired by an electron which is accelerated from rest through a potential difference of 1 volt, right? And if the relation between electron volt and joules is this, uh, it is like 10, 0.16 and then we want to say 10 joules or 1.6 and then we want to say 10 joules. Right, and we also have discussed this uh, molecular interpretation of um, internal energy. Uh, but one very interesting thing that we haven't discussed is if I have this microscopic or molecular level interpretation or understanding of internal energy, then uh, is it possible to use some, 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 uh, or find some average energy and, uh, uh, and uh, find you in terms of the, that average energy and this average energy is basically coming from uh, statistical mechanics okay so it comes from the statistical theory of matter and uh, where we are describing matter in terms of particles remember in thermodynamics that's a very interesting thing in thermodynamics macroscopic thermodynamics we use we use uh, properties like pressure volume temperature so for example volume we think of one liter of water we don't tell that one liter of water contains how many molecules of water and how are each molecule behaving uh, of water behaving and stuff right that is not impossible to describe but we just tell one liter of water and immediately people will understand what i am asking for right it's all a macroscopic description of matter not really molecular description because if it is a molecular description as you know say for example i have this one mole of helium atoms enclosed in a container Okay, and this is a three dimensional container, so it has a volume and we have one mole of helium atoms. One mole means Avogadro number of helium atoms, right? And this is a monoatomic, helium is a monoatomic gas and it is enclosed um, at, uh, uh, you can liquefy helium, but uh, we are assuming that uh, it, it, it is in a gaseous state. Currently, we are considering it in a gaseous state and um, you can liquefy, liquefy helium at a very low temperature. Right? But here we are to, uh, looking at it as a at, at a room temperature, and we are telling that um, uh, this mon monoatomic gas is enclosed in this container which uh, has some volume, right? Now, if I have to describe each atom in this monoatomic gas, then basically I have to know the position of each atom and the momentum of each atom in this three-dimensional container. Now, if I want to know the position, as you know from Three-dimensional coordinate geometry, you require to basically specify three coordinates, right? X, you have to tell, you have to specify X for each molecule, you have to tell, or each atom, you have to tell X, Y, and Z. Now, if I tell momentum, let us assume that all helium atoms have the, means uh, that's a fair assumption that all helium atoms have the same mass, right? And we are telling that if it has, it has the same mass m, then I have to specify the momentum. So, momentum basically. Or if I tell momentum per unit mass, momentum per unit mass is, so let's call it momentum per unit mass, which is basically the velocity. So we have the position, which is x, y, z, the three coordinates, and you have momentum per unit mass, which is like vx, vy, and v. So if you have one mole or Na, which is Avogadro number, One mole of a G, which is equal to any atoms of helium where any equals to six point zero two three. As an approximation, I am telling 6.023, then but 3, there may be more some more values in the let's say you can go to some four or three, fifth or six decimal places, you will have some more numbers. So I am just using up to three decimal places 6.023, then button 3. Now you have these many number of atoms of helium in this box. Let us assume now in this box for each of these atoms, I have defined these three positions, right? Three positional coordinates. And the three components of velocity like v, vx, vy, vz. So basically, I require 
or uh, it requires means basically if I want to describe it at the molecular or microscopic level or the atomic level basically we have this Describe 6n, 6na, basically 6na uh, 6na positions, so basically like 6na variables, right? So you have 6na variables to describe are required to describe one mole of helium at uh, some temperature temperature right you require six NF variables which is like a very huge number of variables. On the other hand, if I just tell one mole of helium the chamber contains one mole of helium, it adds something temperature T. I specify the temperature, I tell the, uh, the, the mole number, right? How many moles of helium are there in, inside? I can also specify the dimensions of the container. Once I have done that, that's good enough. Means I don't really require this molecular level description of helium. Like if and if I require such. It is impossible to describe because it's it's like you require to know the instantaneous position and velocity of six point zero two three hundred per twenty three atoms, which is uh, it's impossible, right? So that is a problem. But this basically gives you one very interesting idea. So uh, if you see these atoms are basically moving around, right? And it has this something called translational kinetic energy. So for each atom. I can tell we of mass m the translational kinetic energy is nothing but half m vx square plus half m. See the vx vy vz can be different for each atom, right? But basically, you have like vx for all these n atoms, vy for all these n atoms, and vz some values of vx vy and vz. So basically, if I know that, then I can write these are my this is my translational kinetic energy, right? So basically, what I am trying to say is that each of these atoms have will have this different degrees of freedom, like six degrees of freedom. If I tell, and it can be like more degrees of freedom even. So if I think of like uh, translational kinetic energy, for but here, for example, if I take a uh, here we are talking about monoatomic, but if I think of diatomic uh, molecules like hydrogen or if I think of uh, uh, mm, uh, uh, a water molecule, right? Water molecule contains H, right? And uh, 2H and 1O, right? So 2H and 1O. And if I tell that, see, there are, uh, so it can basically rotate, uh, right? It can basically rotate. Then on an average, I can tell that about some axis and I know the moment of inertia. So if I can I, then it will be like we are adding another term, which is the rotational kinetic energy, which is half i omega square, where omega is the angular velocity, right? So you have half i omega square, so this is called the rotational kinetic energy. Now, another thing, if you have, if you assume these atoms are interacting, and then you can think of these atoms are like balls, so you can assume these atoms as ball, like balls, and they are connected by springs, and say for example, as you can see here, this is a, a plot of a potential energy, and we are telling that at a given temperature, R naught is the equilibrium, right? R naught is the equilibrium distance between two atoms. So R naught is the equilibrium at a given temperature distance between any two atoms. Means equilibrium intermolecular distance. Or interatomic distance. But see, at a given temperature, at some temperature, there will be always these atoms, they will not they will always be displacing from their uh, equilibrium position, slightly displacing from the equilibrium position. Say for example, they are displaced by say R0 plus x or R0 minus x. 
Now that is so, and spring or and you know that uh, this is spring and these are like two balls and if you look at the restoring force, for example, and you are thinking of now a simple harmonic motion, right? So about the mean position, so about the mean position, you are displaced by an amount x. So you have half k x square, where k is the spring constant. Where k is the spring constant, and it is related to the it is related to the bond that forms between these atoms. Right? The spring spring represents a bond between the atoms, right? So, so k is related to the bond energy. So k is the spring constant. So, if you can see, then there is a vibrational kinetic energy. So, all these things basically constitute the degrees of freedom at the microscopic level. Now, at the microscopic level, from the classical mechanical point of view, so again, you have also potential energy at the molecular level, right? If you have an ideal gas, then the potential energy is not there because uh, there is no interaction between the, 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 the gas molecules. But if you think of a real gas or if you think of a condensed matter, means condensed. Um, phases like solids or liquids, then you are having interactions between atoms and molecules which give rise to different types of bonds, right? Ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and metallic bonds. And say, for example, in ionic solids, you have, say, like uh, sodium chloride, you have sodium ion and chloride ion, one is positive and another is negative, and there is a Coulombic interaction, right? An electrostatic interaction between these um, ions, right? So, if you think of example, uh, one example is like NaCl, so you have like Na plus ions and Cl minus ions, and then there is a electrostatic interaction, Coulombic interaction. Again, bond energy, so there are different types of bonds that can form, like ionic bonds between in ionic solids, then there can be covalent bonds, right, uh, where um, uh, you have all these uh, different types of hybridization, and uh, say, for example, uh, bonds between carbon and carbon and hydrogen and carbon and carbon, so, or polymers, and then basically you have metallic bond, like in aluminium. Say for example, in aluminium, all electrons are delocalized, so basically atoms are, the, 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 ion, the, 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 the atom cores are embedded in a sea of electrons, right? Like these electrons are delocalized, so you form something called a metallic bond. So in each of these bonds that form, again, I am not discussing this, this will be discussed in some courses on physics of solids. Okay, the details of it will be discussed, but I am telling that this will give rise to this bond energy and this bond energy again can have, you know, um, it can be a very complex polynomial, you can represent with a very complex polynomial or some, some function. Now, all of these are happening at the microscopic level, but if all of these are happening at a microscopic level, for example, for a monoatomic gas, I can tell you that if we apply a liquid partition theorem, which is coming from classical mechanics, what it states is that if you have an assembly of particles that are in equilibrium at a temperature T, that means that are in equilibrium at a temperature T means the mean temperature for this assembly of particles is T, right? The temperature is T. It is held at a fixed temperature T. Everywhere the temperature is same. The average, then in such a case, the average or mean value, right? The average or mean value of each quadratic contribution. Now, quadratic contribution to energy is something like i omega half i omega square or half m v square. This is like a quadratic contribution. So, each quadratic contribution, right, it can be from these different types of kinetic energies and also it can be from uh, potential energies, right, because uh, if there is interaction between the atoms or molecules. Now, all of this, so for example, if I take a monoatomic gas, ideal gas, and we are talking about um, uh, monoatomic, so you are not considering any rotational kinetic energy, and there is no interactions, and uh, there can be some vibrational kinetic energy. But assume that it's mostly translational kinetic energy, then uh, because yeah, you cannot have a, a, a vibrational kinetic energy because you know uh, there is no bond formation or no interaction. Uh, so as a result, you have only the translational kinetic energy, and translational kinetic energy means there are three degrees of freedom, right, Vx, Vy and Vz. So, each of these, right, each of these quadratic contributions, the, uh, the average or mean value of each of these quadratic contributions for all these atoms are the, is the same and is equal to half kbt, right, where kb is the Boltzmann constant and Boltzmann's constant is nothing but universal gas, uh, gas constant, uh, gas, gas constant, which is R, Sorry for the mispronunciation. 
So the universal cash constant R, we will write with A in his vector number, which will basically be KB and KB is Boltzmann's constant. So it is, as you can see, NA is the number of atoms. So KB is 1.38 into minus 3 joules per Kelvin and it is also basically per atom. Right? For example, R is joules per mole Kelvin and this is like KB is joules per atom Kelvin. Right? So you have KB which is joules per atom Kelvin. Now, you have three quadratic terms per atom in a monoatomic gas and so if you add them, then you see the mean internal energy per atom for this monoatomic ideal gas is 3 by 2 kV, right? And then if you have total one mole of atoms, which is like the Avogadro number of atoms, Avogadro number of atoms, right, this Avogadro number of atoms per mole. Then we can write Um, which is like the, 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 mol, the molar internal energy is equals to Um0. So, this is Um0 is the molar internal energy at t equal to 0 Kelvin plus 3 by 2 and 3 by 2 kVt is per atom, right. So, 3 by 2 into Na into kVt and Na into kV is nothing but R, R is the universal gas constant. And so you get um0 plus 3 by 2, right? So that's your internal energy of a monoatomic ideal gas which has 3 degrees of freedom because there is no interaction between the atoms. So you have uh, the 3 degrees of freedom because of the translation of kinetic energy, right? If you think of a molecule, say for example, a diatomic molecule which has also this rotational kinetic energy, then you add another half kVt. Now, if you also consider vibrational kinetic energy, you can add half kV square. So, it can become like 5 by 2 kVt. In some cases, it can come like if you also consider quadratic terms that come in the potential energy, it can be like 3 kVt or some kVt, right. So, basically per atom, the mean value, right. And it comes from equipartition theorem of statistical mechanics, right. Now, note that for condensed phases, whether it is solid or liquid, the interacting atoms the potential energy of the interacting atoms always have a contribution and uh, for example in ionic solids it's like Coulomb, uh, Coulombic interactions between the ions and then there is metallic bonding in metals and um, but one thing to remember you can it's not very easy say for example uh, there are some simple potentials that can describe uh, interacting atoms in uh, real gases however interactions at the molecular level become very very complex when you consider condensed phases. This is something that we should always take a note of, okay. So, um, so that is the idea. So, again I go back to the first law and because I want to use this definition of internal energy and I want to incorporate it in my, uh, into the principle of conservation of energy, right. So, what it tells is that energy can neither be created nor be destroyed, right. There are various forms of or various restatements that we can use of the internal um, energy, right. So, energy can neither be created nor be destroyed, but can transported or converted from one form to another and the total energy unit of the universe is constant. So, there are many ways of restating the same, right, this principle of conservation of energy, right. And um, if we know that, then there is something very interesting that can, that can be written, it's, 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 we all know. But we want to, I want to write the differential form and I want to tell because I have already defined something called an exact or total differential. I haven't, I have told that if you have this inter, uh, total differential or uh, exact differential, you can integrate uh, between initial and final states, right, without thinking of the path, right. I haven't defined in exact differentials, I will come to that and I will also give an example of what is the difference between inexact and exact differential because in an exact differential depends on the path, but before all of these I have to first uh, restate the first law of thermodynamics in a, uh, in a uh, simple mathematical form. So remember in these cases, so basically there are various books like uh, I have mentioned right at the beginning of the course, uh, say for example book by 
uh, Richard Swalin that you can use as a textbook and then uh, book by uh, Gaskell and then uh, Robert D. Hobbs book. and there are various other books that are there uh, and each of these books uh, use uh, different uh, sign conventions when it comes to uh, stating the first law right so sometimes um, um, uh, we use a convention uh, we, we use different conventions so sometimes you will see uh, ask, uh, I, I'll come to that so here what convention we are using is very simple so as we know now the molecular interpretation of internal energy so we will be very we will try to be as consistent as possible and what we are telling is if there is a heat input to a system then basically you are adding to the internal energy of the system right you are increasing the internal energy of the system so as a result heat input to a system is positive similarly if i am doing some mechanical work on the system again you are basically uh, this mechanical work is tending to increase the internal energy of the system as you can understand because you are bringing the molecules closer there may be more interactions yeah, by, uh, the, by forcing the atoms uh, uh, nearer you can increase the interactions or you can basically add to the internal energy right increasing the energy so in both cases heat input as well as work done on the system we are taking means wherever internal energy is bound to increase of the system is bound to increase say for example if I am doing work on the system or compressing the system for example uh, or I am uh, adding heat to the system I am exciting the molecules in the system, I am adding to the internal energy. So, in such cases, we are telling that all of these are positive. So, heat input to the system is positive, work done on the system is positive, while work done by the system against the external pressure is negative, according to us. And heat projected by the system to the surroundings is uh, going to be negative. Right, so basically Q is the heat, so if we have Q as the heat input to the closed system and we have W which is the mechanical work done on the closed system. Now, one very interesting thing that we will mention soon that there are different types of systems like this is closed and you have isolated. So, there are uh, various categories of system are open, uh, so we will define it shortly, but first let us restate first law in a simple math form. So, you have Q that is entering and we are assuming heat input to the system is positive, work done on the system is positive, work done can be mechanical work, it can be chemical work or some other form of work and then with all of these things that come in, what happens is your system was in an initial internal energy of Ui, it has changed to Uf and you as I told you that internal energy before is Ui and means at a reference, at a reference configuration is Ui and after addition of heat and work it has become say for example Uf, then the change in internal energy is what matters the most and change is delta U and delta U is nothing but Q plus W according to and it is a closed system so delta U equal to Q plus W is the principle is according to the principle of conservation of energy or according to first law. Now, if the system, say for example, the system is moving and the system has some 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 position or some special position in a uh, potential field, I can also add all of those. So we can think of like Q plus uh, delta U equals to Q plus W, and uh, uh, delta U is a like change in internal energy, but we can think of also adding change in potential energy, change in kinetic energy, and stuff. But we are basically considering a closed system where delta u which is a change in internal energy is equated to q that is the heat input to the system and w and both of them we have assumed to be positive but it does not really matter so this is what i just was about to say whatever sign convention you use if you are consistent it does not really matter the relations do not change right it is not yeah so the infinitesimal or differential form is where it becomes interesting now as you can see du i defined as an exact so D, so D, when I am using D, so I am telling that this is the total differential, that D U is the exact differential. However, heat input or heat transfer or work done generally 
basically these are basically path dependent functions like work work amount the work done or heat input these are all path dependent functions so as a result delta q and delta w we are using delta c we are not using d but we are using delta this denotes inexact differential where the integral depends on the path taken so in this case the integral is path independent right it, uh, we could just integrate like this du i to f and that was like u f minus u right but here you cannot it depends on the path taken right we will give an example of that for example if i tell that there is a function z or z of x and y such that dz is an exact differential that means integration of dz does not care about the path that has been taken right and let us assume that z x y is nothing but x x times y and we have this is the y axis and this is the x axis and i am plotting say i have the value of x and y to be 0 comma 0 and i have gone to something like 2 comma 2 right 0 comma 0 to 2 comma 2 and the, the value of z x y is x times y right now i have taken different paths right i have taken different paths to go paths to go from 0 to 0, 0 comma 0 right this 0 comma 0 coordinate is the origin to 2 comma 2 say for example i have taken a path like i go from 0 comma 0 to 2 comma 0 then from 2 comma 0 i go to 2 comma 2 here i have taken a path like this right a curvilinear uh, path right uh, it's almost like a sine wave type of things a sine or cosine wave type of path again i have taken another path which is just like directly going from 0 0 to 2 so three paths i have delimited one is this one one is one is this one and the other one is like this one is like this and the other one is like this. right all these three paths are there but what i told the initial point was 0 0 and here is 2 2 and we are telling dz so dz basically is dxy right so dz is but because z x y equals to x y so dxy so dxy means y dx plus x dy now i want to know so if i know dz i want to integrate dz right i want to find delta z that is change in z this is the delta z delta z is nothing but integral of dz from 0 0 that is the initial step to the final step which is 2 now you see z is nothing but xy so i can write d xy which is coming from 0 0 to 2 2 and that means i am just using xy and putting the limits and the limits are basically the initial position and the final position 0 0 and 2 2 and this becomes uh, 2 times 2 minus 0 times 0 which is equal to 4 so dz is a total or exact function so you can see that whatever path has been taken when I did the integral, integral of dz, I just looked at the initial uh, position and the final position. I did not look at what was path was taken to achieve this final position from zip starting from 0 0, right? And I, so whatever be the position taken, as you can see, delta z just depends on the initial and the final states, and we got an answer to be 4. Now look at an inexact differential. Let us assume that we have an inexact differential which is given by delta w equals to y. So, again you have this um, coordinate system y versus x and now delta w I have given as y dx. Now you see I have asked two paths, one path is like when going from here to here directly along the diagonal and another path is like I go from 0, 0 to 2, 0 and from 2, 0 I go to 2, right. Now if you see when I go from 0, 0 to 2, 0, my equation is y equal to 0. And when I am going from 2, 0 to 2, 2, my equation is x equal to 2. Right. Now, so this is, this, this is the blue path. And this is the, this is, say for example, the, the yellow or diagonal path. 
So this delta w in the first path in this along this path, if I have to find out delta w, the delta w is the amount of work done or work means it can be like delta w is nothing but uh, the integral of delta w is nothing but integral of delta w. And there I am again giving some, these are my in initial and these are, this is my final coordinates. Now this is what I have written, now delta w is y dx, so I will write y dx and it is going from 0, 0 to 2, 2. Now y is nothing but in the first case, when I am going along a diagonal, when I am going along this diagonal, the equation is y equal to x, right. So instead of y, I have to x and this becomes x dx and now the x values are 0 and 2. So I just keep 0 and 2 and x dx is x square by 2 and 2 to and 0 to 2 we put the limits and I get a value of right. Now let us look at the blue part. So I go from 0 0 to 2 0 from 2 0 I go to 2 2 and now I am looking at finding delta w which is again integral of this small delta w, right. This is the, 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 the uh, upper case and this is like the lower case delta, right. So, you have this triangular delta and then you have this uh, delta here, this is the small delta. So, if I have that, now I am integral, uh, integrating. So, I have to integrate along the path, right. So, I go from 0, 0 to 2, 0. Now, 0, 0 to 2, 0, what is the equation? y equal to 0 and I put y equal to 0 here. So, this integral is value is 0. Now, I go from 2, 0 to 2, 2. Now, in this case, the equation is x equal to 2, whatever with the value of y, x equal to 2. So, if x equal to 2, that means dx is constant. So, right, if x equal to 2, then dx is constant, right. And so, this, uh, this value also goes to 0, right. So, you have 0 plus 0, which is 0. So, in one case, you got a value of 2, when you have when you are traveling along the diagonal, in the other case, when you took another path, we get a value of 0, right. So, basically, this is an inexact difference, this is an example of an inexact differential where the integral of this inexact differential depends on the path taken, right. So, that is the idea. Now, as I have told before, that there is this universe, and this universe is basically the system that is the system that we are focusing on, that the body of matter, the system is this body of matter which we are which is the focus of our study and this is everything else everything else means everything other than the system now i could have made it as big as possible but I have kept it small enough so that what I am telling is this is my system, this everything other than the system that is influenced by the changes in the system. If the system is changing because of some process, then what is the region of influence and that region of influence the surrounding and the together it forms the universe. This is something that we are clear and we also talked about there is a boundary between the system and the surrounding which you, call, you, can, which you can call wall or a boundary and this boundary's property determines how heat transfer will take place from system surrounding or how what transfer will take place, various works uh, transfer will take place from system surroundings, right. Whether it is a chemical work, whether it is a mechanical work, how will it take place is based on the property of the wall that separates the system from the surroundings, right. So, this we already know that the region outside the system that is influenced or affected by thermal changes of inside the system is called the surface, right. And this boundary or wall, so that is the, I told you, that is one of the most important things to consider because this wall and the boundary basically will give you the physics of the process, right. It separates the system from the surroundings and for the state of a system, you know, it is the condition of the thermal system at the time of observation which is described using a set of thermodynamic properties, right. The, the, the state of a system can be 
given by a set of thounding properties. For example, I can give the state of a system in terms of U, which is the energy, then V, which is the volume, and more number of different species like N A, then B, then C. These are basically A, B, C are the components, right? A, B, C are the components that are there in the system. So all of these thermodynamic properties basically describe the condition of a thermodynamic system at the time of oscillation.